Thank you everybody for joining in this evening's webinar. I am really, really excited to share with you some new horse feed technology that we are incorporating into the pool and grain line of equine feeds. Um, the Care EQ uh, logo you will see displayed and we're gonna discuss that as we go through. So who are we? Who are you listening to right now? Um, that's my picture on the top right there. That's my name, Dr. Tanya Cubitt. I'm tonight's presenter. Both myself and Dr. Stephen Duran are uh, uh, partners in Performance Horse Nutrition. Stephen, Dr. Duran, founder and president of Performance Horse Nutrition. Uh, and we are the nutrition consultants for Pool and Grain. I will be presenting this evening, but Dr. Duran will be answering questions live because I know you're going to have lots of questions. So what I want to encourage you to do, as you can see on this slide, is type into your chat box any questions that you have and Dr. Duran will answer them live as we go through. That way we don't have a, a boatload of questions at the end. You can see the chat box looks like that little speaking bubble. If you click on that, you can type your question and he will respond back. I also want to make sure that um, everybody stays muted. Sometimes it, it flips off and we hear people coughing and talking to their, their friends and yelling at their kids if it's me. Um, so with that, we will go ahead. So we're going to discuss a little bit about forage testing that Pool and Grain does and what we've been able to learn from that forage testing, a little bit of uh, some updates to the feeds across the board based on those forage tests. And then we're going to get into the nuts and bolts. And we're going to we're, we're going to end with this new technology, which I call a solution to certain problems that we have. Um, but in order to address the solution, we need to understand the basics of the horse nutrition. We, un we need to understand what is normal and natural for the horse, then understand the problem so that we can better address the solution. So we're going to talk about all those things and then end up with this new technology, which I think is really, really exciting. So we all know if you've used a pool and grain feed, uh, we have um, pool and grain has uh, their own forage testing lab and they put massive efforts into forage testing. And why, why do they do this? Because they understand that the forage is the primary part of the horse's diet and you build a diet from there. So we need to know what's going on in our local forages. And, and to, so that we can design these feeds and we can tailor these feeds based on changes in forage. So that's what we've done. We've gone through as performance horse nutrition and evaluated thousands and thousands of samples, years worth of data from actually three different forage testing labs. And the trends in forages are that crude pr protein, as we would expect, is, is highly variable depending on and the maturity, et cetera, of the plant. But it's trending lower in our local forages. The mineral content was also trending, was also definitely lower. Calcium and phosphorus is much lower in our local haze than it has been in previous years. Um, trace minerals, zinc and copper especially, are lower in, than in previous years. And so we must account for these declines in forages with our, our Poolin feeds. And that is one thing that Poolin does very, very well is they're not afraid to adjust their feeds based on what's going on in forages. Years past, we've adjusted lysine content. So this is something that we continually do is evaluate the forages and make sure that the feeds are complementing those forages. So in the Equipro, ETEC and Decade lines, you may see some changes to the nutrient specs in those calcium, phosphorus, uh, copper and zinc. Slight increases just to better uh, better complement the forages that I mentioned are declining in nutrient value. So let's get into what we're all here for. We want to talk about this new technology, but we want to set the stage with what is normal for horses. Well, horses are meant to eat a wide variety of forages. They're meant to eat a predominantly fiber-based diet. They're meant to nibble continually graze for about 17 hours out of the day and move while eating. 
They're also herd animals and they naturally eat from the ground. This increases drainage of the respiratory tract, significantly increases chewing time, and it prevents muscular tension in the neck and back and maintains proper teeth alignment. This is all normal, natural behavior for horses. On the right hand side, you can see what we more commonly do with our horses because the guys on the left, these wild horses, maybe live till they're 12, 13, but the horse on the right, he's going to live till he's 30 years of age. And in those 30 years, we're going to expect him to have five or six different careers and be sound in every one of them. Um, so we have to feed a lot more cereal grain based diets. They consume these quickly. The other thing we do is we put them in stalls by themselves. Now, some horses really don't mind That's that lack of socialization, but we all have a horse that really does not like being separated from his buddies. Exercise level can vary. Some horses get a lot of exercise, others don't get a lot, but even just their changes in routine can, can um, be difficult for these horses to acclimatize to. Um, we also feed at, with buckets at chest height, which is, again, not natural for the horse. And when you do that, they don't produce as much saliva. Now, saliva is really, really critical because it lubricates the throat, but it also buffers stomach acid. If we just take a quick look at the teeth of the horse, when a horse is grazing, they'll chew about 60,000 times a day. And think of all the saliva that is naturally being produced and all that food that is continually being swallowed and acting as a, a mat on the stomach acid. But when we stick him in a stall and we feed him, say, one and a half percent of his body weight in hay, that would be about 15 pounds and anywhere from six to 12 pounds of grain, that's going to work out to be about 28,000 to 30,000 chews per day to consume that food that we've provided him. So you can see we've significantly cut in half the amount of chews and the amount of saliva this horse is going to produce. I mentioned saliva as a buffer and I like, if possible, to feed off the ground in a tub on the ground because you can see here in this table, if you take two pounds of, of uh, a grain and you put it in a tub on the ground, they will chew that about a thousand times. Two pounds of hay on the ground, they'll chew that about 2,000 times. But two pounds of grain at chest height, they're only going to chew that about 350 to 500 times. Remember, if they're chewing less, they're producing less saliva. And sali one of saliva's primary roles is to buffer stomach acid. So if we move now to the stomach. It's really small in relation to the rest of the digestive system because he was never meant to have a large stomach, right? Because he's meant to be grazing continually. Um, if you look at a lion or a tiger, they have a huge stomach because they are going to be true meal feeders and they need to gorge on whatever they have hunted and, and consume a lot in one period. But horses are trickle feeders. They're meant to be continually grazing. I don't like to feed any more than, say, three to five pounds of grain in a single meal, knowing that the, small, the stomach is quite small. Now, if I cut a window in the stomach and let you look inside, there are two distinct regions in the stomach. And you can see the photograph on the right hand side. We have this dark pink tissue at the bottom and it's I call it the protected region. Scientifically, it's the glandular mucosa. But there is a slippery, slimy mucus coating that protects that tissue because there's little cells down there that secrete acid continually. Because remember, the horse is meant to be continually eating, so he's continually breaking down food with that acid. Now, the top part of the stomach, that light pink tissue, does not have that mucus coating protecting it. So I call it the non-protected region, or it's otherwise known as the squamous mucosa. So what happens when we have this acid build up and build up in the bottom of the stomach, it can splash up onto that non-protected region and cause gastric ulcers. Now, I really like to show people this graphic because I think that it really depicts what is happening with gastric pH while horses are grazing or have free choice access to grass hay. This is what is normal for horses. So if you take a group of research horses and you allow them to graze free choice hay for 24 hours and you monitor the acidity in the stomach and we measure acidity using the units of pH, which you can see on the left hand side of the chart. And across the screen at the pH of four, we've got a yellow line. Anytime the pH is above that, that is what we consider the gold standard that's healthy, normal, 
It's not going to cause gastric ulcers, but we're going to continue to break down the food. So you can see when horses are continually chewing grass hay, they, their pH in the stomach sits between a 4 and a 7. This is ideal buffering for the horse's stomach. But if we take away the hay and the grain, and all we do is let the horses drink water for a 24-hour period, you can see the picture is drastically different. By just one hour after removing the hay and the grain, you can see that the pH of the stomach is now down between a one and a two. So if we just measure raw gastric juice with no saliva buffering it and no food in it, the pH of that acid in the stomach is that's right where it sits, right between a one and a two. So that is raw gastric acid, but that is not the normal place that that pH should sit in a horse. After 18 hours, these horses had bleeding lesions, but by just six hours of feed deprivation, these horses had reddening of the stomach lining and reddening is inflammation, and that is the precursor to this gastric ulceration that occurs. What's not uncommon, and I know we're getting longer day lengths now, so we're out maybe feeding our horses a little later at night, but what's not uncommon is feeding our horses by between 5 and 7 at night and not coming back till 6, 7 o'clock in the morning. That's a 10 to 12 hour window where horses aren't having anything to eat. Because remember, it only takes about 30 minutes to an hour for food to pass through the stomach. It'll hang out in the, digest the rest of the digestive system longer. So it, it's very easy to see how our normal management practices uh, create these issues of gastric ulcers. So about 90% of our performance horses, really horses that live in stalls, have gastric ulcers. About 60% have them in the hindgut, which we're not going to address hindgut ulcers tonight. Um, and about half the population have them in both regions. You can see, remember the photograph I showed you, um, when we were looking at the stomach, the two distinct regions, that dark pink tissue down the bottom and that light pink tissue at the top, you can see those gastric ulcers forming right above that line. We call that the margo placatus, the differentiating line between the two. And these are quite deep ulcers here. They would be considered grade three ulcers. So what causes ulcers? Well, Fasting. What is fasting? The time between meals where they're not eating anything. Meal feeding, high grain diets, low roughage diets, not feeding enough hay, stress, transport, stabling, intense exercise, long term use of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs like bute will actually wear away at that mucus coating. Now, I know this time in our world is a little different, and we're not probably transporting our horses and doing a lot of exercise by going to shows, but horses are still under stress. I'm sure their routines have changed. Maybe there's different people feeding them. Maybe there are less people at the facility. So the times of day that they're feeding are different. So horses stress over small changes in their routine. But if we start with forage, what's the absolute bare minimum amount of forage that a horse needs to eat would be 1% of their body weight. So for a thousand pound horse, we're looking at them eating at least 10 pounds of forage per day in order to just keep the gut moving, keep those, those muscles that push the food through the gut moving. Now they'll lose weight, they'll develop stereotypic behaviors, no doubt gastric ulcers with that small an amount of forage. Um, but it will at least keep their gut moving. Now, a weight loss program, if you have an overweight horse, I would feed about 1.2% of their current body weight. That would be about 12 pounds of forage. But know that every time you decrease the amount that you're feeding a horse, minimize their intake because you're trying to, to um, manage their body weight, you have to manage those horses even more intensely because no matter what, we're still trying to mimic grazing behavior in our management practices. More general recommendation though is between one and a half to two and a half percent of body weight. I usually do balance all my rations based on about 2% of body weight. So that's about 20 pounds of forage that they should be eating per day. Know that this time of year, if your horses are eating a lot of pasture, these are dry matter values. Pasture is about 80% water, so they have to eat a lot more pasture. We average about two acres per horse if they're going to get all of their fiber requirements out of pasture. It's very moist right now, very lush. 
So that's a little bit on the digestive system and the amount of forage that a horse needs. You can see we're building a story as to the problems that we create with our normal management practices. And I don't think anyone would disagree with me that gastric ulcers are one of the biggest problems we see in our horses today. So what's our solution? Because I can't tell folks to stop feeding grain to horses that need those carbohydrates for speed. Um, we're not going to stop putting horses in stables because there just isn't the physical land mass for all of our horses in these smaller areas where we're, we're housing them. We're not going to stop going to shows and just let them live out in the field. So we need to, as um, caregivers, and health workers for the horses, we need to make sure that we're adding ingredients to the feeds that are going to make their life a little easier, that are going to help them out. So the most recent addition that we've made to the feed is a novel source, a new source of calcium. It's a marine derived source of calcium. You can see this really neat logo that we've created, the Care EQ logo. Um, there are two major benefits to this new form of this more bioavailable source of calcium. Number one, helping to buffer stomach acid. And number two, bone density and bone health, because we know calcium helps to buffer acid. And it's also incredibly important for bone density and bone health. You'll see this logo will eventually be on the bags that this product is going to go into. And we'll discuss that. So it'll be very recognizable, um, the bags, on the bags. So this marine-derived calcium, scientific name is lithothamnium. I dare you all to say that five times fast. It's a natural and, and marine ingredient. It's made from, it's really sourced from fossilized red algae. It's rich in minerals, uh, antacid properties, the buffering capacity we've talked about, and it acts to stabilize pH uh, in the stomach. You can see a, a photograph of it there in its natural state. If you look at it under a microscope, what makes this calcium source so much more beneficial than other calcium sources like limestone, which is calcium carbonate, is the porous structure. If we go to the next slide, it's really easy to see the honeycomb structure of this marine derived calcium. Look at all those surface areas now that the acid will hit against so that it can buffer, that the enzymes will have to absorb that calcium. So it's this increased surface area that makes this source of calcium so much more bioavailable, so much more efficient at buffering stomach acid and for bone density. This is a great graphic here, just looking at the buffering capacity. And if we look at other ingredients that are typically used for buffering capacity, we have sodium bicarbonate or baking soda, calcium carbonate, which is limestone, typical source of calcium used, um, and then the marine derived calcium. And you look at the soccer field here, the bi sodium bicarb kind of buffers the goalpost area, the limestone or calcium carbonate, the circle in the middle. But because of the structure of this marine derived calcium, the buffering capacity covers the whole field. Now, I want to get into a little bit of research that's been done um, in horses, particularly on this novel source of calcium. This was a study done in New Zealand looking at gastric ulceration in adult horses. So it was a 30-day treatment protocol, and they used a supplement containing marine-derived calcium. They had 10 horses, ranging in age, and males and females. On day zero, the horses had ulcer scores anywhere from one to three, so mild to quite severe. By day 30, 100% of the horses had significantly reduced ulcer scores, and 70% of the horses had an ulcer score of zero after 30 days. I mean, that's pretty significant. The two horses, three horses in this trial that didn't have 100% zero ulcer score only had an ulcer score of one, so they were minor. So I think that is really significant information there, proving the buffering capacity of this product. So if we switch gears and we look at bone formation, marine-derived calcium, it's highly bioavailable. 
And we know that calcium plays an important role in bone turnover and bone formation. So this study looked at bone metabolism in young growing horses and yearlings, and partic particularly looked at osteocalcin. And what is osteocalcin? It's a biochemical marker for bone formation. So we're looking at a marker for bone formation. And the blue bars, we're looking at limestone or calcium carbonate supplemented horses. And the orange bars, we're looking at the marine derived calcium. You can see across the board at 28, 56, 84, and 112 days of supplementation that these horses had significantly increased bone markers for bone formation. If we look at a, a, another study that looked at um, horses, young horses that were in training, thoroughbred horses, and we know that with these horses are still young, could be two, two and a half years old, so they're still actively growing, and they're constantly remodeling bone. So constantly turning over bone, and it's really, really critical in these stages, especially when putting this heavy workload on them, that we're able to supply them with calcium sources that are going to maintain that bone turnover, that rapid bone turnover, and that bone density. And again, you can see two different views of bone density here at 30 days and 90 days of treatment. And the red bars are the animals that were supplemented with marine-derived calcium, and the blue bars, they uh, were the control horses. And again, significantly elevated bone density in these young exercising horses um, when they're supplied with the uh, marine-derived calcium. These are incredibly uh, good research studies showing the effects of these uh, this marine-derived calcium. Now, one final um, uh, benefit is uh, some research done at Michigan State looking at the reactivity to stimuli, so the kind of behavioral response to a, a fright um, that horses in training had when they were supplemented with this marine derived calcium. They did a, a reactivity test from point A to point B when they startled them. Um, and also a reactivity test when they were standing in a, in a confined place and they measured nervousness and found that the horses that were supplemented with the marine-derived calcium had a reduced negative reaction to this unexpected fright. So a, a slight calming effect. So where are you going to see this ingredient included initially. So you'll see the logo again that I've got up at the top. We're going to first include it in the Decade Challenger and these, these inclusions started on April 1st. So it's included in the Decade Challenger. <clears throat> it utilizes the marine derived calcium. You'll see this logo printed on the bags eventually. Um, buffering of the stomach acid, bone density, bone health. Why did we choose the Challenger? We have a lot of customers that utilize this product in breeding operations. Um, and we know that a lot of folks also use this for their exercising horses. So it was really important for us <clears throat> to add it to the Decade Challenger. If we go to the Equipro line of feeds, the Mare and Foal and the East Coast Race. And I think it's pretty self-explanatory why these two feeds, Mare and Foal, because of that superior bone density and bone health. Also, some mares can get a little stress, so helping those mares with buffering that stomach acid. And the East Coast race, twofold really. We know that pretty much every race horse, be it standard bred or thoroughbred, um, has some degree of gastric ulceration, so it's gonna help with buffering that stomach acid. <clears throat> but also we've got a lot of these younger horses constantly turning over that bone, um, that are exercising and eating this product. So buffering stomach acid and, and bone density with these two products. And finally, with the ETEC line of feeds, again, we're going to include it in the Fibromax and the ETEC 1. <clears throat> Same here, we've got a lot of folks with the lessening quality of hay that I mentioned at the beginning. A lot of people are looking for a higher calorie 
feed for their mares, their brood mares, and are going towards Fibromax. So we've actually altered the feeding directions to account for more people feeding Fibromax to brood mares. And we know we have a lot of people that use Fibromax that want a lower carbohydrate, um, high fat, high fiber feed for horses that have issues with gastric ulcers and just gastric distress. Um, so it's in the Fibromax and then the E-Tech One. We have a lot of customers using this um, for a wide variety of horses. So that's all. I, I, I wanted to keep it short for this evening so that you could have plenty of time for questions. I know that you've got lots of questions. I do want to point out that you need to stay tuned for more exciting feed tech updates.